We've got to move beyond science experiments. We've got to put AI into the hands of people in a trusted way that performs with policy, has ethical development standards behind it, transparency around it. And I think all of those things are going to be critically important to the market as a whole. But that's where Click is taking a leadership position. For those of you who listen to the podcast frequently, you may know that early in my career in the tech industry, I did a lot of work in the data analytics and business intelligence space. So this one was a real treat. I've been watching this organization since the age of big data, and I've watched their evolution towards becoming a major player in the data analytics space, helping many organizations make sense of their ever-increasing vast data estate. The organization is called Click, and we are very lucky to have James Fisher onto the podcast. He is the Chief Strategy Officer of Click and has witnessed the evolution of data analytics and business intelligence firsthand, previously working for SAP and business objects, uh, more recently Click for the last 10 years. And he's very well qualified to provide commentary on how enterprise organizations, any organizations, can leverage AI to optimize their data usage, and also ultimately reduce costs and increase efficiency. This was a fascinating conversation. James speaks with passion, and during the interview, he was proudly wearing his Click t-shirt, so he's quite clearly a passionate advocate for the Click brand. In our discussion, we covered what CIOs need to consider when adopting AI, the hidden cost of technology, what James learned from his seven years at SAP and Business Objects, and of course, the societal impact in light of the proliferation of AI adoption. I really love speaking to passionate technologists and James certainly ticks that box. It was a fantastic interview. I'm really excited for you to hear it. So without further ado, here is James Fisher. James, it's lovely to get you on the Tech Leaders Podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. I've been really excited about this one. I've been tracking Click for for quite some time. Yeah, it's great to be here. Lots of directions to go in, but we always start with this flagship question to get things off to a good start. What does good leadership mean to you, James? So I've been very fortunate over the course of my career to have, have worked with some incredible leaders and, and uh, have some mentors that I still speak to today from the very, very first job I got at PwC out of uh, out of university. And all of those leaders have instilled sort of one key principle, which I tried to carry forward, which is around openness and around communication. Um, you can be great at your domain. You could be an expert in your field. You can work 36 hours a day. But with people around you, communication is key. And certainly in my role now as as Chief Strategy Officer here at Click, then communication is one of the key things that empowers people, lets people know what they're part of, what is being expected of them. And if you get that communication piece right, then you're pretty much uh, halfway there. Oh, absolutely. I think communication is definitely one of the the pillars. I mean, you don't really ever make a leadership role if you if you haven't got good communication skills. I absolutely and you don't excel in it unless you're exceptional with your communication style, I suppose. No, I completely agree. That's a really good answer. What do you like about being in a leadership role, James? What's your favorite part of leading people? I've always enjoyed the ability to influence an outcome and, and, and drive towards an outcome. And again, tied to that communication, you know, sharing why we're doing things, the reasons behind it, what it means for, for folks, and then seeing them be successful. You know, there's folks I work with today on my team that have moved through different roles at Click. You know, we've developed people internally. We've seen people grow from offering someone that first job out of uni as a, as an intern. That's that's how I started, and sort of paying that back to to interns that that we've had, and then seeing them grow into to leadership roles across the company and and, and on my team is a real privilege and a, and, a, and a pleasure. And that's more exciting than, than all of the other sort of things that go with, with leadership that, that folks could talk about. Yeah, sure. No, well said. So I want to give the listeners a bit of context who may not be familiar with yourself or maybe not even with Click. So you studied business studies back in the mid to late 90s. I know you graduated in 1997 and joined PwC afterwards. Is that is that right? So I'm really keen to just, if you could just give us an overview of that guy who graduated 
join PwC and just give us a little bit of an overview of your career up until the point of joining Click. Yeah, ab- absolutely. So I did a, a, a business degree. And, you know, one of the things that attracted me to that particular business degree is it gave me two six months work placements. And I was incredibly lucky to spend six months at KPMG, and then spend another six months at what was Cooper's Lie brand at that time, or what became PwC, you know, and I was I think I had two white shirts, I was incredibly green, I had one suit, and walked in to, to the city on that that first day and and really didn't know what to, to expect but you know met and worked with some incredible people and really that sort of shaped my focus and and gave me an opportunity at the end of my degree to go back work with the team I worked with at what was now PwC in the sort of group reporting space we did a lot of financial fast close projects around how helping organizations report their numbers and, and go through that governance and compliance process more efficiently. And it was through, you know, an extended period of time at PwC that I got the opportunity to start working with different elements of software that PwC had and acquired and eventually looked to divest those around sort of 2000, 2002 after the Sarbanes-Oxley and the audit independence requirements came in. And that gave me the opportunity to join a company called Cartesis, which was based in Paris, relatively small organization that had been previously acquired by PwC. And then we, we grew that, we nurtured that. It was in the financial reporting performance management space. We built out that portfolio. Again, sort of developed my skills across communication, analyst relations, into to marketing, communications, and then ultimately into product marketing and product management. And that's what gave me the opportunity then after and that was acquired by business objects and then SAP subsequently to broaden that role, spend more time in the analytics space. And you know, that leads me to where I am today. Fantastic. So I'm really keen to hear about your experience working with SAP. Obviously, it's a very influential behemoth. We've had actually had the CFO on not too long ago, Reynard Aid. I think it's a fantastic episode. But yeah, Reynard was talking about how SAP has, has really jumped all over the AI stuff and, and, and has aimed to you know innovate products or place a lot of emphasis on innovation in the last couple of years. But I'm keen to get your thoughts on, on what you learned from that experience. I know you joined in 2007. You spent nearly seven years there. What lessons did you take from working for an organization like that that you put into practice in your career following that experience? Yeah, so if you, if you think about Cartesis, it was a relatively small organization, then got acquired by Business Objects, you know, which was a renowned leader in the, the, the uh, business intelligence space. And then that got acquired by SAP. There was an increasing, dramatically increasing scale of organization around everything that, that we did. You know, there were, there were thousands of employees, you know, hundreds of different products that could be sold. And, it, you know, so that scale, that being part of that that larger organization, you know, looking to bring the product portfolios to, together around the performance management space. Both business objects and SAP have been very acquisitive in, in that domain. So building a roadmap, you know, enabling our teams, enabling our customers and, and the market for what that ultimately meant, you know, was very, was very challenging. And, you know, you learn a lot about, I learned a lot about influence, how to work and collaborate across diverse teams, whether that's geographically, whether that's across the industry teams, the technology teams that SAP had. And again, that that notion of influence, it kind of goes back to that point of communication I mentioned earlier, yeah. that ability to work with people to influence and drive an outcome in a very collaborative way. I think anyone can sort of run up a hill and drive through a wall. But if you leave a trail of destruction behind you, that doesn't help people want to be on that journey with you the the next time around. So I learned a lot at SAP. I mean, an incredible organization, incredible founders, an incredible brand, incredible product set, and an experience that, you know, I carry with me today. Yeah, I I suppose business objects was a was pr- probably the most successful BI product, business intelligence product up to that point. I, correct me if I'm wrong, James. It was implemented in many in in most enterprise organizations at one point, wasn't it? Yeah. Obviously, you worked on the product marketing side. Is there any specific lessons that you learned in the early days of working with such a successful 
business intelligence product that stay with you now in your, you know, into your tenure with Click? Yeah, well, obviously, the, the business intelligence, the analytics market has has changed dramatically over the over the course of the, the last 20 or, or 30 years. You know, I think business objects was, you know, a key leader had some unique technology in, in supporting what I refer to as effectively as a very report centric view of analytics, you know, very structured, owned and managed by IT, a very kind of governed environment, therefore very, very scalable, very, very, you know, kind of trusted. So, so absolutely, you know, the, the market changed around that. There's been greater demand for, you know, a new way of looking at data and analytics. And of course, that's, that's where, where Click comes, uh, into the, uh, into the conversation. But, you know, I came into, to business objects on the performance management side. So financial reporting, planning, budgeting, forecasting, uh, you know, scorecard management, profitability, cost analysis. So a little bit different to the core business intelligence that business objects have been, have been known for. So again, that point of influence is, is critically important. You're uh, effectively looking for mind share. You're looking for mind share in pre-existing customers. You're looking mind for mind share in our go to market. In our in our services teams, in order to put your product and capability out there, that really refined from a product marketing perspective, you know the ability, the importance of clarity of message. And again, yeah. back to that point of leadership, I had a great mentor who really instilled the, a methodology around creating structured messaging and, and what that means, how you pull that together. I'm sure many folks will have heard of a three by three message house, but that's something that, you know, even my first day at Click, I sat down and said, right, where's the messaging? Where's the, the roadmap? How do we pull that together? You know, so right back from that, that first day of uh, uh, business objects and creating that new framework. We've carried that forward and it still exists today here at Click. Sorry, can you elaborate on what you mean by a three by three message? So quite often you look at messaging in in, in the market, particularly in the tech stack. You go to a, a, a big event, as I'm sure you and your, your listeners do, and everything kind of basically looks the same. You know, cloud is washed on everything. Big data is washed on everything. And, and now AI is, is washed on anything. So a three by three message helps really just focuses in on the core differentiation that the you as a technology organization have uh, and how you talk about it one of the, the principles is you know don't explain everything that the product does but focus in mm. on those things that are uniquely different about your proposition and then you explain the value that they they bring and then you explain the capabilities that enable that and that's where you get that kind of three by three matrix of mm. three key value of props and three key proof points and differentiators against each of them staying on the theme of your of your career and we'll come on to click in a bit more detail shortly but you know in the first sort of the first say two-thirds of your career what what milestones really stand out for you James what what were sort of watershed moments for you or what were really critical lessons that you learned and how did you overcome adversity or whatever it is but but what really stands out for you from that the first two-thirds of your career yeah, so there was a there's an ongoing learning experience. You know, I'm lucky that I've always been in a relatively consistent domain around you know performance management, analytics, business intelligence, you know, data. So I built up a set of expertise, and and by no means prefer profess to be an expert. You know, in my in my field, there's lots of very smart people around, and you know that that's one of the, I think the key things of leadership is surround yourself with infinitely smarter people than yourself. You know, and empower them to be successful. And, and everything will be good. But I've had that ability, that that luxury of, of, of time over over 15, 20 years to build up that expertise, to experience and, and see the evolution of the of the market to, you know, it's a small world. You know, there's there's people that I see today that I've seen work at different organizations. So that's created a, a momentum, it's created a network that has allowed me to to, to grow teams, to pitch for investment and you know expand what we what we do. And I think for me, the milestones really started to kick in when I was at SAP. You know, I came in looking after some of the performance management capabilities, worked with some incredible leaders that again nurtured me, that 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 helped me develop. 
And there was obviously change. You know, we, we do, you can't live in the tech industry and not see change around you, whether that's companies being bought, companies making acquisitions, whether that's the economic swings that we see in, in the macroeconomic environment and, and some of the restructuring that inevitably comes with that. You know, that's ever present in tech. So there were two kind of things that sort of came out of it. One was that I was given an opportunity as a result of that, one of the, the restructuring efforts to take on a, a bigger, broader team. Team and then and then build that team. For me, that was, I think, really where I started to see that acceleration that took me to where we are here at, at Click today. But it also was a really important lesson. And, and you know, one of the many mentors that, that I've worked with said to me as we were going into that change, look, you can't influence the outcome of everything that's happening around you. All you can do is really focus on, on doing your part of it and remaining focused. Yeah keeping your team focused on your part of it. And that will put you in the best position. And that's what we did. We kept our heads down. We kept delivering. And that gave me and, and ultimately my team to to go on to to have a broader remit, be asked to take on not just some of the performance management, but more of the the mobile, the ERP, and and then indeed the BI solutions at, at, at SAP and support that from a product marketing perspective. And you know that was that was a, a great opportunity that I I uh, like to think I've never looked back from. Absolutely. So mid twenty fourteen, an opportunity comes to you to join this 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 probably not that well known company click obviously they probably i think you were called click tech back then but in in sap terms probably a, a much smaller company and less established talk us through how that came about and that period of your life yeah so funny enough we were we were, we were talking earlier you know my wife is actually part swedish part welsh and the family lives in a place called lund in in southern sweden in malmo which is incidentally where click was founded and where where click was um headquartered for for many years until you know the grew in the u.s presence so funny enough you know i i i'd known click professionally because of of of, you know being in the business intelligence space and seeing what the the company was doing and the the very rapid growth trajectory and momentum it had around yeah what he called business discovery data discovery you know a more sort of uh business focused set of capabilities and i i knew it because it was on the the doorstep step of my family's my family's home in, in Sweden so there was a lot of familiarity with it but you know you, you get a phone call and says hey I'd like to talk to you about about joining click and you know at that point not only had I been as you said earlier at SAP for a number of years I'd been at business objects and at Cartesis and that had been a, a, a period of, of I think nearly 16 15 16 years of continuous in, employment in one in one company so it was a big change and it was a, a big decision to to take the call and and ultimately a, a bigger decision to to make the leap from you know SAP as I said earlier incredible brand to 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 click. This episode was brought to you by B Digital. B Digital support leadership teams to optimize cost and get more out of technology investments. B Digital and the team have unrivaled expertise with technology license management and data remediation and are therefore perfectly positioned to help prepare organizations for AI technology capability. And on the last point, B Digital have just developed a cutting edge AI readiness assessment, which provides tech leaders with a platform they need to make well-informed decisions about AI adoption strategy in 2024 and beyond. Go to bdigitaluk.com to find out more and get in touch. So can you to, can you tell us a little bit about the culture that you joined at Click then b- back then and how that's evolved right up to now? How would you describe how would you describe the culture at Click? Yeah, so I like to say that I think I had more interviews at Click than uh, <laughs> most people have in a lifetime, and I think that was a little bit of them getting comfortable with me, is but also me getting comfortable with them. I had the opportunity to meet towards members of my team. I had the opportunity to meet, you know, members across the the executive team, and not just the 
the CMO that we're in. But one of the things that, that was part of all of that is this notion of, of values. And Click has always had an incredible focus on its, its core values and investing in people around those values. You know, so making sure that someone is qualified to do the job, it has the experience to do the job, has the domain expertise to do the job is, of course, critically important. But can that person be successful at Click? Can that person work within the Click culture? And that's something that as a company we put, you know, huge emphasis on even today going through all of the acquisitions that we've made. Making sure that culture, those values persist is, is, is critically important. Of course, it's changed. It's evolved from being a single product on premise maintenance company headquartered in Sweden to a global footprint headquartered in the US. It then went through an IPO process. It was taken private again in, in, in 2016 with new investors coming in and it's transformed along that time scale. But the secret source of the, the technology has remained unchanged and the secret source of, of who we are as an organization, the people, the DNA of Click has evolved, but is still the beating heart of who we are. Yeah, I've got to ask you about this, though, James. I mean, obviously, I'm just thinking in terms of the last 10 years, in terms of the exponential growth of data volume, okay, is skyrocketed, obviously, in the last 10 years. And the growth is accelerating through just the sheer volume of data collection across the millions of platforms that we've got these days. So how has Click adapted its technology to ensure scalability and performance without compromising on the speed or accuracy of the insights? Well, so we've we've made investments over our thirty year history, and and you know I, I like to say that the the secret source of Click, which is the analytical engine, it effectively is a, an AI engine. It's got an AI patent. It uses machine learning to understand the relationships that exist within the data that's that's being analysed, and that has a, a huge benefit in terms of how you explore data. You know, SQL is a great tool for moving data, but a terrible tool for analysing it. You select exclude you select exclude you know click persist that experience that exploration experience across the data so as the data volumes have increased as analytical complexity is increased as we move from descriptive to diagnostic to predictive and now more so predictive and generative forms of analytics and ai the foundational principles i think are, are the same you need to make sure you've got uh, a, a robust uh, technology robust development processes you've got to make sure that you're listening to your partners and to your customers in terms of how you're building and delivering product to, to market. And you've got to look at the elements that influence the core of, of what you're focusing in on. So for us, the core of what we were focusing in on was, was business intelligence, was analytics. But what became much more important with that growth of data is how do you make it available? How do you acquire that data? How do you bring that into a place where it can be worked with? You know, data literacy has been a, a, a big issue. So how do you help people work with the data and understand it in situ? So the notion of the data pipeline, the analytic data pipeline has become much more important in how you acquire data and then take that from an insight and into a, an action. So understanding that has been a big focus of, of what we've been looking at over the course of, of the last few years. And that's really what you see result in the, the end-to-end portfolio of solutions that Click offers today in the cloud. Yeah, because I think you, you kind of joined at that sort of crossroads, I suppose, around 2014, didn't you? When it was shifting from... You know, this big, big, remember big data, that was the term, wasn't it? Everyone was talking about big, you don't hear that so much anymore, do you? I, I think Click's products seem to shift over to more of a advanced analytics and had that AI integration around the time that you joined. So you kind of joined at the time of this new era of the product. Is that a fair statement to make, James? That's absolutely fair. So, you know, look, Click had, had, has had built an incredible base of, of very, very loyal customers and partners around the, the world, you know, with the, the ClickView product capability, you know, I guess as I describe it as a, you know, data discovery capability, very mode one analytics, if, if folks are familiar with that Gartner term, so very report centric. And then that's evolved into into being much more analysis centric or, 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 you know, Gartner will refer to as, as 
as mode two in many respects. So, you know, the, the, the notion of big data, though, I think is a really important. And 2010, the evolution of, of big data, the need to then work and transform data, that wave kind of kind of happened. And in 2014, Click had responded to that with the release of, of its ClickSense capability, a much more self-service orientated analytical, analytical tool. And by that point, I think more or less, Certainly in the, the following few years, we solved all of the big challenges with, with big data. That may seem like a, a big statement to make, but these the idea of the, the four Vs of big data, volume, velocity, variety, and veracity, you know, all need to be addressed in order to, to work with that. And I think in that there's a sort of mid twenty tens and towards twenty twenty as a as a company and I think as a as an industry, we've done a pretty good job of of addressing that big data to wave. However, where we are right now now, we've almost reset the clock. And that evolution into AI, into much more predictive, prescriptive and generative capabilities, and the amount of data, as you referred to earlier, that's being created, you know, we've got a lot of work to do once again, particularly around the variety and the the veracity of data for use cases moving forward. So how do you think the recent explosion of generative AI and the buzz around that, I'm sure you've obviously already made evolutions to your product set off the back of large language models and the impact of large language models on businesses. What does the next five years look like for Click from a product development standpoint, James? So, you know, as I said, we've we've built out our capability into the cloud. We've developed an end-to-end solution that can acquire data from any source, move that, transform it, provide trust and veracity around that, deliver that to any target, whether that's for operational or analytical use cases, and then provide a product portfolio that gives all forms of of analysis on top of that, including, you know, some of the recent announcements we, we made around unstructured data and being able to ask questions of unstructured data alongside your structured data in a conversational format. But then thinking about how that evolves in the world of automation and pushing those insights into action, into downstream applications is all part of the vision that, that, that we've built out. I think as we move forward, you know, we're now at a, at a, at a crossroads when it comes to, to, to AI. I think we've seen a huge amount of experiment, experimentation over the, the course of the last 12 to, to 18 months. I think we've seen a lot of top-down directives around we should be using AI. AI, so let's go find a, a reason to use it. And I actually think, you know, we're making big, big investments in the market as a whole around acquiring infrastructure and acquiring compute capabilities. Um, we've been able to turn all of that investment into real value. We've got to move beyond science experiments. We've got to put AI into the hands of people in a trusted way that performs with policy, has ethical development standards behind it, transparency around it. And I think all of those things are going to be critically important to the market as a whole. But that's where Click is taking a leadership position. And I think we believe very strongly that if we can help our customers do and get value from from AI, right from a trusted data foundation, leveraging AI to augment the analytic data pipeline and how people work and use data, but then create meaningful insights that can be actioned, that's really going to put us in an incredible spot moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. So moving away from from Click and and your product set a little bit, I want to get your thoughts on a couple of things around the impact of AI, James. Let's maybe focus on enterprise organizations. What is the biggest impact to enterprise organizations over the next couple of years that CTOs, CIOs need to be thinking about? Yeah, so it's interesting. I was I was looking back to one of and listened to one of the, the podcasts you 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 did with uh, Burn, the co-founder and CTO of Dynatrace on the rise rise of the chief AI officer. And certainly, there's a there's a huge amount of focus there. I think what we begin to see now, and and I was was fortunate enough to be talking to formerly the CIO of of a, of, a, of a large diplomatic organization who's now got a, a sole title and focus around AI innovation. And I think what we're beginning to see here right now in, and in the enterprise space is a wave of innovation. 
Right now, we're trying yeah. to use AI for the co-pilots, you know, as help assistants. But the, the reality is that this is going to create a wave of business innovation. That's business process innovation, better market innovation and, and product innovation. We just, I don't think we can, anyone can, can accurately predict where that will take us. There are risks associated with that. There are opportunities associated with that. But sure. when we think back to the advent of the internet and what that what that meant, you know, as a search tool, as an email capability, how that morphed into potentially the ability to buy books online, for example, to what it is today, to the types of platforms that we're working with. You know, we'd never imagined the impact of all of those things for economically, yeah. you know, from a productivity perspective, or even from a from a sort of a, a socioeconomic perspective. So that wave of innovation that's going to come is, you know, I think something that is going to be incredibly exciting, but we've got to be ready for it. We've got to make sure we've got the right ethics and policy in place and learn from, I think, some of the lessons of what's gone before with the internet, for example. I'm particularly interested in spiraling costs of, of SaaS products and spend generally, whether it's on labor or other things. But, what well, you know, I, I often hear that, you know, the cost of, of, of IT and, and software is ever growing. Uh, but what, what advice do you give to CIOs to keep, keep a handle on their, their spend in relation to software and, you know, and potentially in the context of AI, you know what I mean? And, and cutting costs via, via AI and efficiency. Did you get involved in those conversations about managing spend for enterprise organizations, for your customers, through efficiency, through, through other means? Is that something you've got? Have you got any thoughts on that? So it's, it's an interesting topic. The, and the, the cost debate around technology has, has you know, been going on for, for some time. And certainly, you know, we've seen a, a, an evolution of business models. You know, the vast majority of the, the software that we all work with today is now available on, on a subscription basis. That changes some of the economics. And I think we've largely and successfully been through that transition, both from a, a technology industry perspective, but also in the way in which the enterprises consume that technology. But I think the notion of, of cost of ownership is something that is, is critically important moving forward. Of course, everything around us is, is more expensive these days and the tech industry is not immune to that. But I think it's really important for technology leaders to understand the hidden costs, to understand what it actually costs to implement and run a set of, of technologies. That moves far beyond the, the nuts and bolts of the, of the enterprise license. But actually, what does it mean to be part of a, of a technology ecosystem? I think we've seen the rise in, in recent years of, of the notion of the modern data stack, if I put it in the context of the world that I work in. And, you know, there's a lot of hype around what that that meant, the agility and the speed that went with that. And that was very attractive. But it also comes with a lot of technical debt, a lot of query cost. That is not predictable. You know, consumption-based pricing methodologies, I think, can be problematic. We you know, operate in a capacity oriented well that provides predictability to our customers and, and, and to our partners. So I think you have to look at the raw technology ecosystem, how things will interact together and how those things will support efficiency in operation as opposed to force you down a path where, you know, to get access to the data, you are going to have to pay for lots and lots of query on an ongoing basis. And, you know, that's going to become more important as we think about uh, AI and generative AI and the fact that we've, we've de democratizing the ability to individuals inside an organization and increasingly folks outside of the firewall to ask questions of your, of your data. So that would be my, my key focus is is broad think about the ecosystem and, and cost of ownership as a whole now oh, that's really useful so can i just take the conversation back a little bit i want to talk about clicks ecosystem and culture okay because i know you guys have been very active in the m a world in the last well for, for quite some time the what i want to focus on here james is what steps do you take to ensure the seamless integration of new companies like talent into clicks ecosystem and culture yeah it's a it's a it's a great question and it's not an easy answer to it there's not a silver bullet here but it all starts i think with with the engagement so when we look at our product portfolio and how we're investing organically we're also looking for those opportunities to invest inorganically and bring in unique skill sets unique technologies that can help broaden that our vision and there are many many examples of of, of that, as you say, you know, from our acquisition of, of Attunity a couple of years 
years ago, then through into things like the Big Squid, the AutoML acquisition, Talend last year, and, and then the Kindy capabilities, which form part of the, the new Click Answers generative AI. All of those things start with a with a need. And, you know, Talend was by far the biggest uh, acquisition of a, of a capability that, that was incredibly complementary. So we saw that fit. We also saw the market demand. We we often refer to this this wave of investment around AI and generative AI as really the opportunity that we were looking for by bringing Click and and, and Talent together. So there's that that first step is the kind of I think that natural synergy in terms of technology and, and opportunity. And of course, um, we then spend a lot of time looking at the culture of the the teams that we're uh, looking to partner with, looking at the technology and making sure that technology is a good fit for where we are. We're a cloud technology platform. We've invested a huge amount in our infrastructure and the rigidity, robustness, security, you know, trust around that. And we will not compromise that for anything. So there's a set of foundational elements that come into play. Um, but when you're able then to, to get a, an acquisition complete and bring two companies, two teams, two technologies together, yeah. it's critical that, that you, you, you do that quickly. We've made big investments to, to build a, a muscle memory around our ability to bring all aspects of two organizations together, two organizations of, of scale. So focusing on the people, the communication around what we're doing, the communication of the strategy, bringing shared values together. Sounds like a simple step, but you know, yeah. Talent had a set of values, Click had a set of values. We wanted to bring them together, so we felt as one as one team. And then, of course, there's all of the the roadmap, the clarity around the roadmap we need to bring, the back office systems and processes stuff you need to bring. But if you do it right you can achieve great things. You can retain incredible talent. You can create opportunities for people to take on new roles, new responsibilities. And of course, you can deliver you know, incredible product to market. Only a year after closing the talent acquisition, you know, we announced and made generally available the combined Click Talent Cloud, really is that end-to-end data solution to support AI initiatives and create that foundation for AI. And you can only do that if you act decisively and you move with clarity of purpose absolutely very well said now that's really interesting some really good advice there i think and lessons for any company who's looking to engage in any 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 form of m&a act- activity but but look uh, sustainability is, is something i wanted to ask you about james i know it's a core value for click so c- could you share with us some of the sort of initiatives click is driving in terms of corporate sustainability and how this aligns with your business goals it's something that we're incredibly passionate about and and the focus is broad you know from environmental sustainability in terms of our own operations and our desire to get a 100% reduction in our emissions including scope 3 emissions by 2030 is is critically important we have a big investment around diversity equity inclusion belonging and supporting our colleagues and creating a safe place for folks to work and then we have a big investment through our foundation clip.org to support a whole host of different charities that are out there in in the market that are trying to do great things and that data can actually help them, you know, do great things. So we made a lot of investments here. Our customers, of course, are looking at their own sustainability initiatives and we're part of their, their supply chain. So that's a key component of it. Of course, we can help our customers with some of the requirements that exist around sustainability reporting. We're an analytic tool and it's all about, it's all about data. But perhaps the biggest investment we've made is working with organizations, you know, like the UN around climate climate change, with organizations like Air that we see hope and others that are looking to, you know, support a direct relief as another example looking to support uh, humanitarian crises around the world and how they can use data to do that. So we've created an investment program, a software grant program that we deliver software to a number of these charities. And then we work with our teams and our our partner ecosystem to help them get value out of that data and and drive real meaningful change that that impacts people's lives. So there's something we're incredibly passionate about and I think is in the DNA of everybody that works at Click. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go back on to AI then and its impact, James. What are you most excited about and what are you most fearful of? I'm most excited about 
the opportunity for innovation, the opportunity to empower individuals. We've successfully over centuries used technology to make our lives easier, to give us more time to improve our overall work-life balance or, you know, whatever it may be, from farming to the industrial revolution to, you know, the internet and, and where we are today. So done right and done well, there is there is such an opportunity for, for innovation. And as I said earlier, innovation that, that I don't think anyone can can really, really foresee. And that's a that's an incredible place to be right now. You know, to be part of that journey, to be working in this space, you know, it is is just incredibly exciting. It has to be done. It has to be done right. Yeah, you know, sure. we've seen with the internet some of the social impacts, and whether you argue it's good or good or bad that that you know our, our kids are all on their phones and devices all day long, as opposed to you know playing out in the the, the fields and the, and the forests when when I was growing up. You know, that's a I guess a, a slightly different debate. But we've got to make sure we we harness this and implement the use of AI. So we go through that innovation process ethically and and responsibly i think you know if organizations don't have a clearly articulated ai policy on how they work with ai or not just govern the use of ai internally because that will be important i think for some of the regulation comes into play particularly the eu ai regulation which will put very specific guidelines and penalties around how ai is is used and and seek to prevent the misuse of it but transparency in in responsible ai development communication of when AI is being used, the remediation of the, as an individual when AI impacts uh, a decision that may may impact your life, they're all the things that that concern me. And yeah. I think we've got to we've got to invest in the technology, but we absolutely have to invest in that policy and that that governance that yeah. that goes with it. If we do those things well, then the the returns are I think significant. Yeah, the governance one is in a hot, we could do an entire podcast on that. I think that's an enormous subject matter. But I, I think what one thing that I, I think I wanted to ask you about is what do you say to organizations typically in terms of organizing their data to benefit from tools like Copilot and so on and so forth? Maybe this this, this does move into governance as well. But, you know, very high level generic advice, because I mean, you can't just, you know, it, it's the rubbish in, rubbish out principle exists in all forms of any integration, doesn't it? And I think if you you can't just implement AI tools and expect magic to happen. Obviously, you have to have your data in a in a position where you're going to benefit from this 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 incredible adoption of of this capability. But what sort of generic advice do you give to organizations in terms of the the, the quality and, and and preparation of their data to benefit from these these tools? Yeah, so I put it in a couple of buckets. I think the first thing I'd say is don't wait. You know, there are lots and lots of use cases out there that you can address. You know, you can create a knowledge base of some structured data, ask questions of it to help enablement of team members across your, your organization. There are lots and lots of use cases. But start with the use case. Because if you start with the use case, you'll understand the data that is required to support that. Once you know what data is required to support that, you know where you can acquire that data and where you can then build a, a data foundation, that, whether that's used for traditional BI, traditional AI or generative AI use cases, that data foundation is absolutely key. Acquire the data, transform the data and drive trust in that uh, that data is foundational. And from there, you can build the, the analytic or the AI capabilities on, on, on top of it. But again, make sure you've got clearly defined policy for its internal use and how you're communicating and using that externally. And much like the original BI revolution, don't forget the individuals. You know, the biggest thing that held folks back over the last 20 years in terms of getting value from business intelligence and analytics is data literacy. That still applies today in the world of AI literacy. So making sure you empower your people on that journey as well is absolutely key. Fantastic. Okay. Just wanted to jump on to a couple of things around the, the future for Click, basically. And what is occupying the boardroom conversations right now, James? What, what are we going to see from Click over the next couple of years? 
So for us, you know, we've we've just focused, been very focused over the last year of bringing Click and Talent together and, and delivering a whole new set of capabilities through Click Talent Cloud and indeed the Click Answers capability that I that I described. We are incredibly fortunate to have a, a, a large loyal base of customers and indeed partners around the world. So our core focus right now is leveraging the investments that we've made, helping those partners help our customers really get value from the data that they've acquired and turn that into meaningful insights from AI. There's a huge opportunity to do, to, to do that in a, in a trusted and a, an efficient way. You know, the world is changing around us. The data landscapes and architectures continue to, to, to change around us. That issue of cost that you referred to earlier is critically important. So our focus now is really on applying everything we've got to help customers solve these problems and do it in, a, in an efficient, trusted and, and, and cost effective way. And as the market continues to evolve, as AI continues to be applied, as new technologies and forms of AI uh, continue to evolve, we'll continue to work and focus with our partner community, our customers as a whole, our executive advisory board of customers to really shape that vision and make sure we respond moving forward as we've done over the last 30 years. Yeah, brilliant. Now that makes total sense. So uh, going back into just to wrap up then, James, a couple of questions for you. You're a very busy chap. How do you achieve balance in your life? Uh, how do you ensure that you don't burn out? Well, look, I, I am very fortunate to live in a in a, a beautiful part of the of the world in the UK, surrounded by great countryside, and I have a, a very energetic eleven uh, month old English cocker spaniel who keeps me occupied, come rain or shine, early in the morning and, and in the evening at the, the, the weekends. That and I love being outside. I, I love being out, enjoying the open and space. I love hiking and being out on the trails. So making sure I'm I'm connected, but take the time to to disconnect, take the time to enjoy what's around me. That's at the heart of it. I'm addicted to click. I've always been a, a hard worker. I've always been very passionate about what I do and the, and the people I work with. So I don't think I ever really switch off. But, you know, getting out and about and getting away from the, the, the screens, getting away from the, the phone, which is easy to do with the internet connectivity that I have down here in the, in the countryside, that's my, that's my secret sauce. Brilliant. So looking back now, in your armchair with your cigar, I know you've got a long way to go, James, but just, just bear with me on this, okay? And looking back on your career, that guy who left Kingston University in the late 90s, I'm assuming he was probably about 21, 22. What advice would you give to that guy, knowing what you know now? Well, you're very kind. I'm probably closer to, to the armchair and the cigar than, <laughs> than, than ho- hopefully. I'd, I, I'd, I can I'd, actually I'd see. I can see it in the background, actually. Yes, yeah, you yeah, know, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the armchair is an important addition. I don't know. I think I think I would encourage him to keep doing what he did. Right, work hard, stay focused. There was a great book that is probably done the round so many times called who moved my cheese oh i know it yeah and you Great know book. you know this is a short little read but i would give that book to the younger me probably yeah. a couple of years before someone actually did give it to to me can you just give us a very quick quick overview for the listeners who, who are unaware of that book james what, what what it is and what you learned from it Absolutely, it's uh, it's it's a story of two mice actually, and and it's it's all really a a, a metaphor for for change and how to work yeah. with change, how to embrace change, and it was the same person that gave me that book that, that gave me the advice, you know, around you, you can't influence everything around you, can only influence the things that that you're responsible for, and, and stay focused on those things, and and that will put you in the best position to to take the opportunity when it when it arises, and you know I think understanding change organizationally and, and you know the the opportunities that brings and of course yeah. there are lots of concerns that come with change is a is such an important lesson and the book explores all of those those different different themes so i'd give that to me a little bit earlier because i think if i'd have benefited from that knowledge and that experience a little bit earlier you know i could have perhaps avoided some of the the mistakes and sleepless nights that that maybe did keep me up in the early part of my career fantastic what a great way to end james fisher it's been a pleasure thank you so much for taking us through your career and discussing all the incredible topics we've covered today thank you it's a pleasure thanks very much for having me gareth
Again, very interesting, fruitful conversation. Loads to unpack, as always. We've touched upon some of the topics that we covered in previous episodes related to, especially to AI adoption. So I wanted to focus on and draw attention to something which doesn't really come up so often, but is equally as important, in my opinion. Data preparation and AI, you know, is, is something that's spoken about a lot for AI adoption. And obviously getting governance and processes in place as well for AI adoption. I think there's much, much is being said of that, but there's not too much talk or not as much talk in terms of what I'm seeing, at least, around the human element of AI adoption, upskilling individuals within organizations to not upskilling your employees, if you are a a leader of a technology company, to not only benefit from the amazing power of these AI applications, but also to use them responsibly and ethically. On this point, James compared this to the BI revolution from 15, 20 years ago. Don't forget, The individuals essentially was the message. Don't forget the people in your company. Don't forget the individuals in your organization. Don't forget your employees. Data literacy is key and ultimately AI literacy is key. You went on to make some really good points about how stakeholders and their ability to process data is is crucial to the accuracy and evolution of the AI capability or the AI tool that you're trying to implement. Essentially empower your staff to be highly AI literate, and they will push the innovation for you. And there's a massive conversation to be had around this, but I thought I'd draw attention to that point because I thought it was a really interesting topic to talk about further, and I'm sure we will in future episodes. Thank you so much for listening. Really enjoyed interviewing James. I hope you took something from it and enjoyed it too. We look forward to bringing you some more amazing guests over the next couple of months. This episode was brought to you by B Digital. B Digital support leadership teams to optimize cost and get more out of technology investments. B Digital and the team have unrivaled expertise with technology license management and data remediation and are therefore perfectly positioned to help prepare organizations for AI technology capability. And on the last point, B-Digital have just developed a cutting-edge AI readiness assessment, which provides tech leaders with a platform they need to make well-informed decisions about AI adoption strategy in 2024 and beyond. Go to B-Digital UK to find out more and get in touch. (laughs) 